Good morning, everybody. This is Bill Morella from HSX. Uh, thank you for joining us today to talk about uh, an upcoming population health initiative uh, that we're doing in partnership with uh, the Department of Aging and Benefits Data Trust. Um, so uh, for those of you who, who I have not met, uh, I'm Director of Data Analytics and Quality at HSX. And I'm joined today by Nigel Newton Famous, uh, Senior Engagement Manager for Pennsylvania at BDT. Uh, and I think we also have in the audience um, Dr. Tom Snedden from uh, Pennsylvania's PACE program. Uh, Pennsylvania Department of Aging is funding this initiative. And uh, I'll, I'll ask Tom to, uh, to say a few words at the end of the, uh, the, end of the call. So our, our purpose today is to advise you of a, a population health initiative. And you know, our, our practice has generally been that uh, when we, um, for treatment and care coordination purposes, uh, of course, your participation agreement uh, controls uh, how HSX handles your data and uh, who we're able to share it with. But for any um, secondary use of the data, uh, we generally have to go uh, out to our members for permission. And um, usually uh, you have an opportunity to opt out uh, of any initiatives you don't want your data used for. Uh, and in practice, usually that uh, only a handful of people will wind up opting out of any particular initiative. Um, this one is a little bit different in that um, we are asking you to opt in because uh, it will require uh, an amendment to your participation agreement. And we'll talk a little bit more um, during the, the webinar today about the logistics of that and, um, uh, and how we'll go about doing that. So we, we are seeking your support and agreement to allow HSX to support BDT in work that they do uh, routinely for uh, trying to contact senior citizens in Pennsylvania who may be eligible for uh, PACE and other uh, benefit programs. So uh, those are, I think most of the people on the line are probably very familiar with HSX, so I, I won't uh, do the whole spiel today, but um, you know, what we've uh, been focused on for many years is um, uh, getting uh, patient information to the point of care wherever it's needed and uh, you know that uh, transactional level data that uh, we share every day you know every time someone's getting admitted every time someone has to look up a patient that um, uh, that they're unfamiliar with and that is not part of their health system and they need to get a sense of um, you know their medical history uh, all that work of course is is so important and is um, is continuing but uh, we're starting to use the data in different ways for population health level interventions. And uh, we're gonna tell you a little bit today about uh, one of those projects uh, that we did a, a pilot project on last year to good effect. And you know, many of the other uh, population health programs that we do uh, are um, enabling us to sort of take the next step in uh, HSX's evolution, but also hopefully enabling you to do uh, a better job of coordinating your patient's care and um, and, and managing uh, your patient's experience with the healthcare system. So uh, you, I'm sure you all know that HSX is a, a nonprofit organization, um, and you know we have really been built around community engagement. Um, many of you have um, uh, uh, executives who are on our board from both the provider community, the payer community. Um, community organizations, other stakeholders around HSX uh, that uh, keep us uh, attuned to your needs, keep us attuned to the projects that you want to implement. And I hope that you'll find that the project we tell you about today will be one of those. So with that, I'm going to turn uh, the presentation over to Nija, and uh, I'll come back at the end to talk about uh, how we're going to implement the project we're going to tell you about. Okay, Nija. Yes, thanks, Bill. Um, good morning, everyone. As Bill mentioned, my name is Nadja Newton Famous, and I'm the Senior Pennsylvania Engagement Manager at Benefits Data Trust. So at BDT, which you'll hear me um, refer to us um, throughout this presentation, we are been connecting people to benefits to help their lives become healthier and thinking about smarter ways to do that since 2005. And you can see our mission statement here in this slide. We do that with four pillars, which you'll see below. 
direct service, obviously connecting with people directly for benefits that they're likely eligible for but unenrolled. We leverage our data and technology to seamlessly make that transition from application to enrollment. Um, policy and practice, similarly to what we're talking about here, how do we implement better solutions um, and talk about um, and implement better policies to make it easier for people to connect with benefits? And of course, none of this work would be possible without strong partner, partner engagement. And we'll, we'll talk, I'll talk a, a lot more about that a little bit later. So why do we do our work and what's important? Um, I think that a majority of people on this call really understand and know this, but there are a lot of people who are eligible for benefits, but they are unenrolled for a series of reasons. And we know that if people are enrolled in these essential benefits, that they will do better and live healthier lives. Children will learn better. Working families will be able to secure and maintain employment. And just as important, our senior population are able to um, age in place. And so you can see these numbers that came pre-COVID, so you can imagine that these numbers are even higher now, shows that there is a huge gap and there's a lot of work to do. And this is one of the goals of BDT to narrow this gap and connect people a lot better. So just to give you a, a, just a little bit of information about our national work, um, BDT, although we are located right here in Philadelphia, we are working um, nationally. We are doing this work and connecting people to benefits in six other states, um, as well as working with even more states on policy implementation and waivers. So when you think about our work and you look at our work from 2005, from our inception, we've helped over 7 billion people um, Delivered, we de delivered about 7 billion in benefits delivered to individuals and households. And when we started this in 2005, we started this with the help and support um, and champion from the Department of Aging's PACE program. And so we've been working with seniors from the very beginning. And then even if you look at our um, 2019 goals, we've been able to support um, 55,000 benefits enrolled in just one year with an average benefit amount of about $3,200. And you know, you could just see from these numbers when you think about the population and people who are in need and how to connect them, we're happy to be able to think about ways to streamline and figure out the best way for the various populations that need that work. So for um, this particular project, how we would like to go about doing that with the support of Health, Health Share Exchange and the Department of Aging PACE program is that BDT uh, typically will send an outreach letter to individuals we think are likely eligible for benefits. And so for this population, we'll look to reach out to your seniors that have just been hospital, just released from your hospitals. And in many cases, from upon release, they are either in need of new prescription medicine or um, to renew existing prescription medicine. And so we wanna be able to reach out to them and, and let them know if they're likely eligible for the PACE program, which is a prescription assistance program for seniors to help with their prescription costs, even if they have insurance already. So from that data that HSX will give us of your, of your um, ADT, the, your admission discharge transfer list, we'll be able to look at that list and know who is indeed um, eligible but unenrolled with PACE and reach out to your patients through a, through a letter which, which we call an outreach letter, which we will work over, which we will work and get your permission on um, messaging and come together on. And then we'll send that out to patients and then patients will call into our contact center. The call to action is to reach out to us in our contact center located in Philadelphia. Over the phone, we will do a screening for your patients for multiple benefits, including the PACE program. And then with your patient's permission, we will move forward and submit their applications. We can submit those applications electronically and that is sent directly to the administering agency who will then confirm enrollment at that time. So some of the benefits that we will be able to help with are listed here. And you can see that we will do a PACE messaging because what we found from the pilot, which we will talk about um, before, is that you know our seniors are leaving the hospitals and need assistance with PACE and PACE can really help them with that. But once we get them on the phone, we will continue with the PACE application, but also see if they're eligible for a holistic view of other benefits and supports. 
Now, I understand that many of you on the line today are in Philadelphia County, and so these benefits will um, be available to your patients who call in. I just want to let those know that those who are outside of the Philadelphia County area, this list may be limited. If you look at the child care, for example, the Philly pre-K, we wouldn't necessarily be um, screening and enrolling patients outside of Philadelphia for that. And also, if you look at the shelter and costs, um, the West after LIHEAP, you'll see it says CAP and CRP. That's PICO and um, Philadelphia Gas Works. And so, you know, benefits that are specific for Philadelphia County will be able to do. And for those not, you'll see there's still a slew of other federal and state benefits that we'll be able to enroll and support your patients in enrolling in. So what we found particularly um, around PACE, and that's why we're really excited that the Department of Aging PACE program is willing to help to fund and um, push this initiative, is that there are a lot of our seniors in Pennsylvania that are eligible for this really essential benefit and are not enrolled. And you can see here, um, whether it's why, whether it's because they don't take their prescription or they have other coverages that they think they won't be able to benefit from. We want to try to demystify that and really connect with them. And one of the things that we found is that hospitalization and after they've been discharged is a key time to get them. This is the time to reach this population. This is the time where they're most in need and they're most curious about what they can do and how they can get support. So that, that we found is the best time to act to help our seniors um, enroll into these essential benefits. So what we notice happens for the, from a patient, patient experience is that um, there's several opportunities and times where they, they need assistance with their prescription. Um, they will leave the hospital and feel like they really can't afford to get the prescription that has been prescribed by the doctor. Um, once they get home, they may not be able to travel even to go to the administering agency to apply, even if they do think and want to get um, um, enrolled into the benefit. And then as you know, Many seniors are caught between, do I fill the prescription or do I get groceries in my house for food? And so this is why it's really important that we help them uh, mitigate that by proactively targeting them and reaching out to them to help them get the benefits so that they don't have to make those decisions on their own. So here's an example of the roles that this project will play. We'll use this as a, um, for what we did in the pilot in, um, in 2019. So Mercy Health System was our health system that participated in our three-month pilot. And uh, Mercy provided um, health share exchange with a list of seniors who were um, discharged from their hospital. At that point, Health Share Exchange um, gave BDT that list, and BDT was able to um, share that, um, get that list cleaned, as we called it, with the Department of Aging. And the PACE program was able to eliminate those who were indeed already in PACE. So that allowed us to do a targeted approach to people who are likely um, eligible but not enrolled into PACE and send them letters letting them know of their potential eligibility and encouraging them to give us a call. We were able, also able to look at that data and be able to analyze of those that we outreach, what were some of the outcomes uh, from that project, which I will share with you now. So from the list that we received from Mercy given our from our pilot, we did identify that um, 17,000 of them were on, on that list. Of that, there were majority of people were eligible but not enrolled into PACE. So that again just shows us that there are about 55% of people of seniors leaving their hospital was eligible for this prescription assistance program and were not enrolled and were informed and weren't connected. So that's huge. And that's what tells us that this is the right time and the right population to do this work. And even if you look at those who were removed from the list for outreach, you can see why. And so you, if you look over into the smaller circle, you'll see about 5,900 individuals were eliminated because they were on Medicaid. And then about 2,000 were because they were already enrolled into PACE. So there was 11% from this list that were new names for us to um, enroll into PACE which is huge considering we've been doing this work for so long to know that there's still a huge population out there that we're missing. So when we think about like, so what was the impact? We had a, a pretty pretty good um, conversion rate 
for this uh, for population health um, measures. And when when you think of when we talk about conversion rate, we're talking about of those who responded to the letters and called us. Um, the percent of people who actually submitted their application. This is different than response rate of those who just called us. This is taking it a step further to say of those who called who are willing and, and able to continue with the submission. And that's why it's important to look at the conversion rate um, as well as a response rate. So with this, you can see that over half of the people who did um, call us and we submitted applications for, over half were for PACE which makes sense because it was a PACE message, but it also showed how many people were, um, were not enrolled into PACE to begin with. And as I mentioned before, when we get them on the phone, we see if they're eligible for a slew of other benefits. And so with that, we were able to help a lot of respondents, about 41, enroll into at least one other benefit um, into that program. And so that slide that we showed earlier about that senior who has to make a decision about filling their prescription or buying groceries, we're able to help eliminate that barrier by enrolling them both into PACE and SNAP, and maybe another one like YHEAT for the heating cost in one phone call at one time. And so the ultimate result from this pilot, and again, this was a three month pilot, we were able to submit 141 applications from one health center at Mercy Hospital. And so infusing about 250,000 benefits into the pocket, um, into the pockets of seniors in Pennsylvania, I think is a really good, huge first step. And because of the success of that three month pilot, we're really, really excited to continue with this work with some of you all um, beyond um, three month timeframe to really see the impact and to really make this connection and to really show the importance of connecting um, health data, nonprofit and government work and show that we can all work together for the betterment of our populations that we're serving and in particular, our seniors. All right, great, thanks, Nigel. I'm gonna uh, take the slides back. And um, you know, I just wanna say that uh, we had planned to uh, to implement this project, I think, before um, uh, the COVID, the first COVID outbreak in, in our area, and um, you know that probably delayed us a couple of months actually. And um, you know, I, the, the work that we want to do in this project, I think, is needed as much now, if not uh, more, than uh, than it was before. Um, you know, there are a lot of people suffering, and I think this is a really um, easy. Uh, for those of you on the phone, no cost way to um, to reach out to these people and try to enroll them in benefits that are already available to them. So um, I know many of the people on the phone I know are are the privacy officers. You were one of the key groups that we um, invited to this webinar today. So I'll talk a little bit about um, what data uh, we're sharing, we're going to share with BDT, and um, how the uh, the compliance model works. So uh, the HSX community ID. Uh, that's essentially uh, your medical record number within HSX. Um, obviously, we need their name, address um, uh, uh, to reach out to them. And the first couple of fields here, like the, uh, the phone number, date of birth, social security number, if available, um, all of those are used in our uh, patient matching algorithm. So uh, you know, that's why some of those fields are on the, uh, on the list. Um, we also want uh, their Medicaid ID, if known, that, that will influence, if they, if they are on Medicaid, that will influence, um, uh, you know, BDT's outreach and, you know, they'll know that they are already on Medicaid. Um, we also think their preferred language will be useful um, to the extent that um, a lot of the people are, uh, are not native English speakers. Uh, that will give BDT an opportunity to, um, uh, to reach out to them in their uh, preferred language. And obviously, we need to know the encounter date and the provider organization so that, uh, A, we can keep track of um, how soon after uh, their, in, their hospital encounter we are contacting them. Um, and, you know, no doubt that will probably influence the response rate, how quickly we're able to, to reach them. And uh, provider organization, this is important because um, we are going to be reaching out to them on your behalf. So, um, you know, it's, it's the provider organizations that people have a, a relationship with. Uh, they don't know HSX, they don't know BDT. Um, so we are going to be reaching out to them as, uh, as the health system that they, um, that they just had an encounter with. So in terms of compliance, 
Um, both HSX and BDT are business associates of many, many covered entities. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, we have a BAA and a data use agreement in place already with BDT for this particular project. And uh, obviously, uh, you know, this work is governed by your participation agreement with HSX um, and the, uh, the participant's population health use case. So, um, you know, every health system that enrolls in this project, essentially what you're letting us do is uh, conduct that outreach to your patient, share their information with BDT for that purpose, and, um, uh, and we'll show you what the, the outreach letter looks like in just a moment. Um, as with everything that uh, HSX does, um, any patients who have opted out of data sharing in general will be excluded. And, uh, you know, obviously all of our normal um, uh, data security protections are in place. So the data will be encrypted. We have a, a secure mechanism for transferring that data to BDT, and it will only be retained as long as necessary. So in terms of the outreach letter, this is an example of, you know, from our pilot project, um, the letter that went out from, uh, from Mercy Health System. So, you know, the, the health system is the trusted source that the patient is, more, is most likely to respond to as opposed to whether, you know, if we contacted them on our own or um, even on behalf of the PACE program, which, uh, you know, probably is very good uh, brand recognition. So uh, we're very clear in the letter about uh, the fact that there is a monetary value to the patient, uh, you know, if they are eligible for, for some of the benefits that BDT will screen them for. Um, we are trying to, um, you, know, you know, inform this by uh, a target population. We're, we're, you know, limiting this to uh, patients age 65 and older. Um, and, you know, we will analyze the data to figure out, um, you know, what the best messaging is around um, uh, around this so that, you know, what, what people are, are most responsive to. And then finally, it's a very simple call to action. So uh, we're, uh, the purpose of the letter is simply to get them to engage um, and, uh, and to call into to BDT's application center. And, uh, and finally, down the bottom, you can see that the letter will be signed by uh, a, a health system executive. Um, so, you know, everything about this is meant to communicate to the patient that we are contacting them on, on your behalf. Um, so you know, we're not, um, uh, you know, trying to, to get in the way of your relationship with the patient or, um, you know, use your data outside the context of that relationship. So th the benefits of this for, for you as the health system or the healthcare provider is uh, for your patients to get a better access to, to resources that are already available um, and that may be beneficial to their health and uh, address some of their social determinants. So, um, for patients who are just coming out of the hospital after uh, possibly getting uh, a, you know, a new significant chronic diagnosis that may require them to be on medications for the rest of their life, um, you know that's this is uh, pro there couldn't be a more salient time to contact people with offers of assistance um, than when they've just had a, a hospitalization. So um, we think that this will make them more likely to be um, um, compliant with any medications that are prescribed with this new diagnosis and with better adherence, you're going to get better healthcare outcomes. Ultimately, we hope that will translate into fewer uh, readmissions. And to the extent that you are all taking on uh, risk-bearing contracts for these patients, um, you, know, you will get better results uh, as a result of that. So what do we need for you to do? So um, we're trying to keep this as uh, low uh, effort as possible on your part. Um, all we really need is for you to approve um, HSX's use of your ADT data for this project. And um, we will send, uh, so after this um, webinar is over, we're going to send out the population health notice, uh, a copy of the outreach content. So basically a template for the letter that would go to the patient and a boilerplate addendum to your HSX participation agreement. So there will be, those three documents will be attached to um, to the email that goes out. And what we need you to provide back is uh, obviously we need to, to fill out and sign the, uh, the addendum. And, you know, if you have, um, if you want to have a, a call to talk about any um, modifications you want to make to that, we're, we're happy to uh, engage on that. And um, obviously we will need your, um, your logo and the image uh, of your executive signature, whoever you would like the letter to be um, signed by. And, um, you know, BDT 
uh, will be in the role of um, you know, using the message or the uh, the data that we share with them to um, to match the right logo, the right signature to uh, to the right letter. All right. So uh, as I mentioned, you know the next steps are simply that uh, take a look at the population health notice. Um, you know it's it goes into a little bit more detail than what we covered um, in here today. And uh, we just need the, uh, the three documents to come back to us, your logo, the signature, and the signed uh, participation agreement addendum. And you can send those to Fatima Costa. Uh, that'll, you know, her uh, address will be in the email that you receive. Uh, and that's really all there is to it. So um, you know, we, we scheduled this webinar for an hour, and I realize we've um, just gone over a half an hour, but we wanted to leave plenty of time for um, discussion, questions, conversation, and um, and just to get your feedback on um, on you know, whether you'd like to participate in this. Um, so with that, I will um, ask Fatima to open the phone lines. So uh, any of you who uh, would like to, you're you're welcome to uh, unmute your your line and uh, you know ask any questions or um, give us any feedback. And actually, before I before I open the phones, uh, let me just turn to uh, to Tom Snedden from the Pace program. Uh, Tom, would you like to, to say any words to everybody? Well, I, I think, Bill, uh, you and Nigel covered everything uh, very well. And um, the, the only thing I would say is that uh, in, in all the years that we've been doing PACE, uh, going back to 1984, uh, and all the years we've been doing the outreach, which goes back about 20 years now, um, We've never had a better opportunity than now um, with HSX um, to uh, take a quantum leap towards more uh, efficiently and effectively reaching people who need help uh, in making ends meet uh, and getting a better quality of life. And so I'm, I'm hoping um, that the audience today uh, sees the, uh, the tremendous potential value in doing what um, has been outlined and hoping that um, going forward, um, we can all work together to uh, provide uh, life-saving benefits to uh, people in Pennsylvania who need them. And uh, with that, uh, thank you, Bill and Nigel, for a great job. And, uh, looking forward to hearing uh, questions. So, how we proceed? Thank you. Great. Thanks, Tom. And uh, uh, welcome to your, uh, if you can hang on the line to uh, answer any questions that may be um, specific to, to your program. Um, so, Fatima, do we have any uh, questions? Hi, Bill. Yes. Yeah, so, Aliza Schwartzman asked a question. I'm going to unmute Aliza. Uh, okay. Thanks, Fatima. I actually have two questions. The first one is, will BDT report back to the provider organization which ones of its seniors decided to sign up so we don't uh, duplicate efforts going forward? And also, are there limits in place that the data, the ADT data, will only be used for this purpose and for no other purpose, no research, nothing other than just trying to get seniors these benefits? Okay, so let me, let me weigh in on the part of that, and, and I'll ask you to um, affirm. So the, the data use agreement that we have in place, Alyssa, which I'd, I'd be happy to share, um, is very specific to this project. So. Um, you know, it will not be uh, used for anything else other than this. Um, and in terms of um, reporting back, uh, Nigel, you may be able, to be able to do something more than this. Uh, you have to let me know. Um, but one way that you will know that uh, your members have enrolled in PACE is that um, uh, the PACE program itself is becoming a member of HSX. So we're in the process of, of working through that contract, but eventually, um, uh, uh, any individual who is enrolled in PACE and has a record in, um, in HSX's clinical data repository, uh, the PACE program will be listed as a, uh, a subscriber to that patient. 
So, you know, just like, um, you know, any other um, HSX member who uh, puts, um, uh, you know, who subscribes to that patient through our system. So um, if you're, um, if you have a discharge planner, for example, let's just say one of those patients um, uh, is hospitalized again, their PACE membership will be evident in, um, in their clinical data repository record. So that's one way we can uh, report back. But if you're, if you're talking about reporting back uh, en masse um, on uh, you know, what the success of the program was, you know, uh, Nigel, maybe you could address that. Yes, of course. So um, thank you for your question. So yes, we'll be able to report back um, outcomes, uh, aggregate number of outcomes of um, the list to HSX, just as we did for the pilot. And then we'll be able to break down of those we outreached to, who, um, with the percentage of people that responded to our letters, the percentage percentage of people that we had from that um, of our conversion rate, which I talked about earlier, those who actually submitted applications, and then even looking further into what applications people um, were eligible for that we were able to submit for. We also are able to understand denial reasons if we connect with someone and they do not want to apply, we'll be able to share that information. And so I think that is really good. Um, what Bill shared about being able, you'll be able to get that individual level information from from PACE through that initiative, and then be able to use the um, aggregate and overall information that we'll share with HSX to really see a whole a whole picture. Okay, great. Thanks for that question, Alyssa. Let us know yeah. if you didn't answer it. Okay, Brian. So Brian Duke. I mean, Bill, Brian Duke has a question. I'm going to unmute Brian right now. Brian, you can proceed with your question. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, greetings to Tom Stedden and uh, others who over time have really brought this program to the success that it's having and to this next step. Um, I've worked uh, with Tom in the past and I'm just grateful. Uh, my question is, I, I think a lot of our interactions as was presented occurs after discharge. Um, have there been any discussions or have any of the pilot facilities uh, communicated with patients prior to discharge so that perhaps uh, we start the process of engagement to see if there are feasible if benefits, eligibility is possibility earlier before they leave the hospital? That's a, that's a great question, and, and Tom, I'm sure you, you'll want to weigh in on this. Um, you know that ideally um, that would become part of the um, the routine discharge planning process. I think the they're probably in the best position to sort of recognize the need and um, and probably connect people with uh, you know the right approaches at that point. Um, but Tom, I, I'm sure Pace does a lot of outreach to uh, to discharge planners in general. Uh, well, no, actually, Bill, not not a lot. Um, we we have tried that uh, in the past, um, but have not been terribly uh, successful um, mm -hmm. because I I I never felt like um, it had the support of the hospital administration executives. Mm -hmm. um, we, we may now have at hand um, uh, another opportunity um, to, uh, to try that again. And, yeah. um, it, you know, it, I, I, would, I would like to start a pilot project actually with um, Secretary Duke at the uh, main line uh, because yeah. he has been so supportive of us and, um, I, I'm, I'm grateful that he's on the call and uh, involved in this. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. All right, great. Well, um, anyone else have questions or um, comments? Uh, so Charles Walker, I'm going to unmute Charles right now. He has a question. Yes, my question is just if the social security number is going to be required or if that was an optional field. 
So, uh, right. So, I mean, it's, it's not required um, in the sense that, uh, you know, we, we don't require it at HSX. Um, so, you know, most of the health systems are still um, using it as part of their um, patient matching algorithm. Our system does as well. Um, so it, it is used for that purpose. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's not necessary that it be on the record in order for, um, for BDT to do their work. Yeah, that's correct. We can do it without social security number, um, but obviously with the social security number, we can make a stronger match and um, make sure if someone has the same name and address that we would be able to, to make that differentiate, understand that difference. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, uh, Julia Weatherly has a question. Um, I have a couple of questions. The first one being, have you integrated in um, health insurers or other payers platforms before? Uh, so, hmm, how do we answer that? So, uh, the data that we are sharing with, um, with payers uh, sort of varies by payer, uh, first of all. And the level of integration um, also varies. So, you know, and it, it sort of spans a continuum from, um, you know, plans that are receiving real time um, encounter notifications, just as providers do, um, you know, their, their population health or care manager um, teams are using that kind of data. Um, uh, you know, the, the most sophisticated payers, I would say, are. Um, ingesting the raw HL7 data from us in real time. So that I, I would characterize our level of integration on a continuum um, from a technical perspective. Um, but could you could you talk a little bit about what you're thinking in terms of um, sure. you know, why, why the question? Sure, so if we have like a case manager that's speaking with a member and it sounds like they're having trouble paying for their prescriptions or affording groceries is there a way through um a platform our platform to refer that member to you directly or mm -hmm. how does the referral how would the referral process work for sending a, a member to you all that sounds like or may be eligible for pace or snap interesting so Nigel, do you want to address that do you have sort yeah, of a direct absolutely. referral mechanism Sure. So, you know, this pilot is really focused on um, targeted outreach and just really making people aware who may not be aware and getting people who are indeed likely eligible. And it, it kind of reduces the, um, the screening process and make sure that we are connecting with people who can indeed um, benefit from the benefit, no pun intended. Um, with that said, we do have um, working very closely with um, PACE. We do have the, a PACE application center. Um, phone number a hotline in which um, I'm happy to share that flyer with you and that if you are um, interacting with um, patients who in case manager or think that they're eligible for pays that you can forward um, our number to them and they can call while they're you know still at the hospital or when they get home whichever is think is best um, to be able to call us and we will be able to screen them for a pace and again all those other benefits as well and, and support them in that way. Okay, but you guys don't work with payers yet to um, receive referrals electronically or through like a secured platform. Oh, yeah. So BDT, we have relationships with some payers um, right now, but, um, but it's through this um, targeted outreach model. So payers will give us a list of individuals, um, for whether it's for recertification or uh, people they think are eligible, and then we will then outreach to those pay um, to their members to um, get enrolled into benefits. Okay, great. And my last question is about people that may fall in and out of eligibility. Do you all monitor folks' eligibility over time or help people that may fall out of eligibility for things like SNAP um, and assist them with either connecting them to other programs they could qualify for or uh, anything else? Yeah. 
Um, very good question. So, you know, BDT, our model and our expert is to um, bring awareness and help with um, enrollment. And we're experts at getting them to understand their eligibility and helping them to um, apply for the benefits and try to make those really fussy and complicated at time government applications a lot easier. Um, of course, not the PACE application. That is very great and seamless, Tom. Um, with that being said, once someone is enrolled um, in the benefit, it is um, the decision of the administering agency to um, deem eligibility and get them enrolled. And then the follow-up comes directly from the administering agency too. They get a caseworker and they get those accounts. And so BDT isn't necessarily still closely involved with um, individuals after they are um, enrolled because that connection is with the administering agency with that. We are looking at um, timeframes, especially with partner agencies, as I mentioned, for recertification. So if we know time is up, being able to reach out to individuals and help with the administering agency to notify people of their um, research um, information and help them kind of nudge them in that direction. So we have some projects where we are nudging people to back to the administering agency, if that's what the administering agency prefers, or we will nudge the person back to us. It really depends on the project. So we do have that capability in doing that. Um, and also because we built a relationship with the the, um, the individual, many times they do call us when it's time to recertify for um, a particular benefit, whether that is Medicaid or SNAP, just for us to um, help them with that recertification. So all that to say, there isn't like one streamlined model that we use to do that, but we are touching that in various areas um, in our work. Right, okay, but the journey ends with the, with an individual once you connect them directly to um, the agency that provides the assistance or program, like a PACE or a SNAP. Correct. I mean, we, we will get um, enrollment information and there are some instances where the person may call us back because um, they're having issues with their, um, uh, they need to appeal or documentation. And so we do have areas which we can support individuals continue with that journey. But yes, for the most part, once we're able to submit the application and get them enrolled, we don't, um, our journey in most cases ends at that point. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, I'm checking to see if we have any additional questions. I currently do not see any additional questions, Bill. All right, um, Ray, it looks like Ray Hess has his hand up. Are you able to unmute him? Uh, sure, give me one second. Hi, Ray. I think your line's open. Okay. Hey, Bill. Um, I, this looks like a great safety net. My question is around, we have quite a few initiatives going on uh, while patients still in the hospital um, with discharge planning. We have a care management project that we're rolling out. We're using uh, Aunt Bertha to connect for social determinant needs. Mm -hmm. And uh, my question really is, is there a way that we can coordinate so there's a patient who clearly sees, has a need, but we already have a care manager working with them that we don't have this redundancy and confusion for the patients, but yet have the safety net that others don't fall through. Hmm. Well, I mean, it would, um, it would probably be um, helpful for us to kind of drill down on that a little bit and, and understand better what you're doing and you know, how this project might support that. Um, I mean, just thinking about it from a, um, a marketing perspective, you know, I mean, people often have to hear things many times before they'll, they'll take action on them or, or follow through with them. Um, what we're planning to do is, um, you know, I think, you know, probably not sooner than two weeks after discharge is when, um, you know, when the letter would go out and then, you know, it may be another week or so before people would um, respond to it. So, um, I would think at that point, whatever was going on, um, you know, during their um, their hospital encounter, this would be several weeks after that. So, you know, if, if they've already been enrolled by that point, you know, they'll probably just kind of throw the letter in the trash, I would think. But, um, you know, if they have not acted or followed through on things at that point, 
um, you know, th this may be, you know, an additional, um, you know, an additional touch point for them. But you know, do, do you have um, do you have other thoughts about how, uh, you know, we could do this in a way that would um, support what you're doing? We'll have to take that offline because uh, this is great and I want to support it. I just want to make sure we don't confuse the patients as as we come at them from many different angles. Right, right. Okay. Right, and uh, Fatima, it looks like Elisa Schwartzman has her uh, hand up. Yes. Maybe that was before. No, that was for um before. Sorry, I um I lowered my hand. Okay. Oh. All right. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Looks like that's it. Okay. Um. All right. Well, you know, if um if anyone has uh, questions afterwards, um, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to to either me or Nigel directly. Um. And uh, you know, Fatima will be sending out the uh, the population health notice uh, later on this afternoon. And, um, you know, we hope that you'll engage on this and uh, hope that you'll see the benefits of this and the promise of it as much as we do. So with, with that being said, um, uh, we'll give you a few minutes back and uh, wish you all a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, everyone.